Hi everybody, okay, welcome back. We're looking today at Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek. We're in section 7.3, looking at the infinitive. Today, I'm going to teach you why you're going to just love the infinitive. It's easy to use, it's easy to spot, it's tremendously powerful, and it's quite common. So it's good, all good news today, and there's actually not much to learn either. So easy all round. Just a quick reminder of where we are. We're in chapter 7, which is the chapter on the other moods. It's just entitled Moods. We'd already done the indicative, uh, that's verbs like luo, luace, lue, and so on, which indicate a state of affairs or ask a question about a state of affairs. Uh, so far in this chapter, we've looked at the imperative, giving commands in the previous couple of videos. The infinitive comes here and then participle comes next and a long way down the line, we'll do the subjunctive uh, much, much later in the book. The infinitive today is what we're looking at. And basically the infinitive is a mood of the verb which just contains the bare idea of the verb, nothing else at all. It doesn't say when it happened, it doesn't say who did it, all it contains is the idea of the verbal action itself. And so we normally translate it in English as to do something, to drink, to say, to see, to watch, and so on. The form of the infinitive in Greek is like this, um, with the standard paradigm verb uh, luo, uh, luain, and lusai. Luain and lusai. Like all the uh, verbs in the other moods, uh, the uh, infinitive comes only in the present and the aorist tense. We'll look at the difference between them in just a second. But notice the form, first of all, you've got the stem, lu, lu. Uh, with the present, you just have an ending, ain, which is unique, pretty much unique to the infinitive, and therefore you won't find it anywhere else. You don't need to worry about getting confused with anything. And then with the aorist, understandably, you've got the sigma suffix, and then you've got another ending, uh, I. Now, just obviously, you've got to watch out a little bit here because the I ending of the aorist infinitive is like the ending of the noun if you've got a feminine nominative plural noun. Like, think, imagine a noun like our care, our care, our care, and our care, our care, our chi. Okay. So theoretically, it might be possible for you to get this confused with this. Of course, it won't be possible to do that if you know your vocabulary, because then you'll know that our stem comes from a noun, our hair, whereas lu, the stem, comes from a verb, luo. So again, it is really important to know your vocabulary to avoid that confusion. But most of the time, you'll get very used to spotting the verbs, and it won't be difficult to spot that this is an aorist. Uh, okay, so now just a couple of other things to think about. First, what's the difference between the present and the aorist? Well, as um, uh, Duff points out, and you've got a great explanation here on page 82, the difference between the present and the aorist uh, relates only to aspect, not to time. Well, it couldn't relate to time in the infinitive because the infinitive by its nature doesn't tell you when something happened anyway. And rather as with the imperative, so also with the infinitive, the aorist is the undefined uh, tense, whereas the present tense tells you that the aspect is a process aspect. So let's just consider a couple of examples. Um, uh, if I was going to say, I want to eat, I'm not really saying uh, anything much. When I say to eat, I don't, uh, I'm not indicating that that eating is going to go on for a long time or anything like that. I'd almost certainly use the aorist if I were translating that into Greek. But if I was going to uh, uh, say something like, uh, I want to live, you know, somebody's holding a gun to my head or something, I want to live, well, the living that I'm referring to is a living that's going to be ongoing. I want to live now and I want to live tomorrow. I want to live, you know, for a long time, preferably. Got a lot of things to do and a lot of exciting things to uh, get started with and finish this for a start. So I would use the present tense if I was translating that into Greek. I want to live because it's ongoing. So again, the present um, is not about present time. It's about um, extend, uh, a temporarily extended aspect, so a continuous aspect, whereas the aorist is unmarked. 
Right. Okay, so I said at the start of the video you're going to come to love the infinitive, and let me give you a, a flavour of why that is now. Um, the first is, of course, there's not much to learn, at least not at this stage. You've just got Luane, Lucai, Luane, Lucai. You're going to be able to learn that fairly straightforwardly. Luane, Lucai, Luane, Lucai. Just keep chanting that and you'll be fine. The second reason you're going to come to learn, to, to love the infinitive, you're going to come to learn it as well, you're going to come to love it because it tends to occur only in a fairly uh, restricted range of syntactical contexts. That is to say, it occurs in sentences which have a certain structure to them. And Duff's got some examples of this, sort of two-thirds of the way down page 82. He says, in particular, it's used to convey purpose and tends to follow certain verbs, such as, I wish to do something, I want to do something, it's necessary to do something, and so on. And so what that means is, if you either spot one of those verbs, or you spot the infinitive, it's like you start to get a feel for how the sentence has got to fit together. If you see an, an infinitive, it's very likely, at the, least at this stage, to uh, be accompanied by a, a verb of I want to do something, or it's necessary to do something. Later on, you'll know. And what I want to do is to show you, just as we finish, uh, what, how this looks. Just looking at the practice 7.3 at the top of page 83. I've got a couple of examples for you here. And actually, these highlight a couple of other things which you want to bear in mind as you're translating the infinitive. So let's just do these together, and then you'll see what I mean. Okay, number one, Feles Blepsai. Feles Blepsai. Well, let's just start at the beginning. Um, you've got a question mark. Oh, start at the beginning, he says, and then goes to the end. This, remember, is a question mark. So what we're going to do is translate it as a statement in the normal way. Then we're going to turn it into a question at the end. We'll come to that at the conclusion. But here's the verb thelace. Well, thelace comes from the verb thelo, meaning I want or I wish for something. And so we just conjugate it in the usual way. Thelo, thelace, thelay. Okay, so that's second person singular. And it's you, singular, want, or potentially, I suppose, you wish for something. Now, you want, then what we've got here, blepsi. Now, can you spot what verb this is, what um, mood and what tense it's in? It comes from, can you spot the stem? Yeah, the stem is a little bit of a cheeky one. The stem is blep, blep, because what's happened is that the pi has combined with a sigma suffix to give you a psi, blepsi. Remember that from a few videos back when we were talking about how the sigma suffix sometimes behaves a little bit strangely when it um, follows certain letters at the end of the stem. So we've got blep, which means it comes from blepo, meaning I see. And then we've got a sigma, which means uh, it's either, in general, an aorist or a future tense. Remember, theoretically, it could be either, um, it's, uh, but it's got no epsilon augment. Okay, so normally you might think that's a future in the indicative, but then when you look at the ending, you realise the ending is wrong for it to be a future indicative, because the future indicatives have the same ending as the present indicatives. It's like luso, luseis, lusei, lusomen, lusomen, lusete, lususin, and this has got an I ending. And so you think, you scratch your head, you think, hold on a second, what other verb form is it where you've got a sigma suffix, no epsilon augment, and you've got this ending I? And of course, you can spot it, we've just looked at it, it's right here. In the other moods, you don't get the epsilon augment. You don't need it to identify them because you've only got two tenses and the epsilon augment indicates past time and the other moods don't indicate past time. So what you've got here is an aorist, not a future indicative, an aorist infinitive of I see. And the way you translate that, of course, how do you translate an infinitive? Simply to see. So if you just look at the sentence without the question mark, you've got, you want to see, turn it into a question. It's, do you want to see? Question mark. Well, makes sense. And in terms of the meaning of this, the aorist tense of the infinitive means that the seeing is just, uh, it's not extended in time particularly. It's simply an unmarked, undefined aspect. Do you want to see? That's the first example. Okay, let's look briefly at uh, the second example, which is number three, top of page uh, 83. Uh, let's look at it. De peripatane. De peripatane. Now, this little verb is an interesting one. Um, you look it up 
uh, in your vocab list. If you haven't learned it already, you really do need to learn it because it's quite a common one. It simply means it is necessary. It's a slightly strange verb. It always appears at the beginning of clauses or sentences. And you can easily see why um, uh, this, like the infinitive itself, is a really great verb to spot. Because if I say, it is necessary, in English, you know what's coming next. It's going to be an infinitive. It is necessary you know, to sit down. It is necessary to finish your homework before you start the next video. That kind of thing. It is necessary to do something. So it is necessary. We're expecting uh, to at some point. But don't jump the gun. Let's have a look at what the next word is. And of course, the next word is peripatain. Well, what does this come from? It comes from the verb peri pateo, peripateo, which means I walk or I walk about. And often it has the metaphorical sense of I live. Um, Paul uses this kind of vocabulary in Thanks First Thessalonians. It's like we taught you how you ought to live, peripatain or per and maybe it's the aorist, I'm not sure. But the, the, point, the point is he's using the metaphor of walk as to live. You get the same kind of metaphorical use of the idea of walking in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. It's to walk is to live. And anyway, that's how this, yeah, that's how this verb functions as a metaphor. Peripateo means to walk or to walk about metaphorically, to live. And what we've got here is peripatain. Peripatain. Clearly it's the present infinitive ending. So it's to walk about, or perhaps metaphorically, to live. And just one brief note about the form here. You notice peripateo is an eo verb, so it's got a weak epsilon at the end of the stem. Well, that combines with the a at the beginning of the ending, and because that gives the weak epsilon, the opportunity to turn into something long, in this case a diphthong, it leaves the ending unchanged. So peripatain, uh, to walk, to live, to walk about. So de peripatain means it is necessary to live, or it is necessary to walk about. Okay, so that's your introduction to infinitives, a bit more detail. We've got a halfway practice coming up, we'll do a couple of those together, and then we'll move on through the rest of this chapter, look at the rest of the other moods. Before long, we'll be finishing this off. Actually, participles, which is what's coming up next, are really interesting, amazingly powerful, unbelievably powerful, and very common in the Greek New Testament. So by the time you've got that nailed, really, you will, um, if you can get your vocab up to speed, you'll be able to look at large chunks of New Testament text, and you'll be able to see what's going on in great with great clarity. It'll be really exciting by the end of this chapter, so stick with it, keep going 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, five or six days a week, and we'll have you reading the New Testament in Greek in no time at all. Okay, God bless. Bye for now.